Welcome back to the Toffee Blues, your source for all things Everton. I'm Connor Williams, joined by Paul McAllister, and this is the Extra Time segment on Fulham Everton. Um, no goals. Paul, give me your thoughts overall on the game. Um, it was a good point for me. It, the performance was disappointing overall. Where we were, um, oh, we were okay in the first half. We had a couple of good chances. Uh, we defended well, and, and the second half was pretty miserable, wasn't it, in terms of what we were able to conjure up. I don't think we had any serious moments at all where we looked like scoring. Um, it was all Fulham in the second half. So if Fulham were a dreadful side who were, you know, nailed on to be going down, then it would be a, um, a result that you'd come away feeling like we've really not ourselves down there. They were a the team we should be putting away. But that's that's not Fulham, is it? Fulham are informed. They're above us in the table, deservedly so. I, I don't think they'll stay there all season. I could be wrong, but Fulham are a side that are a lot further along than we are in terms of kind of getting to where they want to be. In t- when you think of you know where their squads at, you know they've got a, a fit striker who's in form. Mitrovic, they've got players who are young and hungry. Um, they've got a manager who, for whatever people think of him, seems to be a much better manager now than he was when he was our manager two, three years ago. So it was a point gain for me. Um, and we just we take it and we go forwards. Would have liked all three. Don't think Fulham are, um, you know, especially good. You know, they're not a team we will look at thinking, you know, there's no chance we were ever going to beat them. I think on a different day we could have beat them. But we're putting in a performance that overall was as poor as it was. Then there's not many teams who wouldn't beat us. So we just got to be thankful for that we got something rather than nothing. Yeah, yeah. I think that's... Um... I think that's bang on the money. It was one of those. Um, and we seem to have them a little bit now, don't we, where some games will watch us, uh, the Palace game in particular, and you think, really great. Then you watch other games and you think, a bit lacklustre, which to be fair, Frank Lampard did say in his, um, I think it was in one of his interviews, didn't he, afterwards, he said, we're a work in progress. People get a bit excited after the ne- after a win. We're looking down the line. We're a bit of a club in progress sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's bang on the money. Yeah, Frank was spot on. Um, he was right when he, when he said that when we lose, supporters seem to go over the top, and when we win, supporters seem to go over the top. I know we, the result against Palace was, you know, um, a big morale lift. Uh, we played some really good football, and we scored some really easy on the eye goals. But it didn't suddenly mean that we were any better aside than we were two, three weeks ago when we were losing games back to back. It was still a team that is pretty mediocre. At best, I think um, there's some really good players there. There's some kind of not so good players. Whether it's because they're just getting on in age, or they're in, in the wrong system, or they're probably just not quite good enough for a club like Everton, considering what Everton wants to do long term. But it was just it was a solid point to build on. Um, I, I think Frank was very level headed, and I think the fans need to be level headed. We can't just be assuming that the world is crap and that we're going to be in a relegation battle again just because we lose a game or we go on a bit of a crap run. And just because we win a game where we play really well and we score some really nice goals, we can't just assume that we're going to be kicking on to being what we were, you know, seven, eight years ago now, where we're competing for the European spots regularly. We're, we're no way near ready to be challenging for Europe again. But at the same time, I still think we've improved enough where we won't be in any danger, surely. Hope, hope, hopefully improving right on that. There's still a long way of the season to go. There's a lot of twists and turns to go. But I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with where Everton are or where we look to be. Yeah, I, I agree, mate. I think um, I think where we are currently now in 12 um, is where I, I personally think is where we'll finish. Um, and I'd be happy with that. It's not For me, this season's not about where we finish in the table, it's about how many points we can get. Really, we're on 14 points now, are we, with how many games played? Uh, 14 and 13. So we've got uh, so we've got 14 points, haven't played 13 games. So we've played a third of the season. Um, so if you times that by three, 14, that would mean four. If we have a run of... If we, play the rest of the season and get results similar to what we have been getting, we finish on just over 40 points. I think the aim this season has got to be anywhere between 45 and 50. And just let's just see where it lands us. Most seasons, you know, 46, 47, 48 points would get you 
you know, easily 13th, somewhere around 13th, 14th, but nowhere near danger. I think um, this season, where, unlike last season, I think uh, the bottom three will be decided, or the three teams that are going down will be decided a lot, a lot earlier than it was last year. I mean, last year, everyone kind of knew that Watford and who else was it who finished bottom? Uh, was it Norwich? Norwich, yeah. Everyone kind of knew that Norwich and Watford were gone by the early spring, weren't they? And it was all about who was going to finish third from bottom, whether it was going to be Oz or Leeds or Burnley, and it ended up being Burnley. I think this season we'll kind of know who the bottom three are going to be by March. Really, I don't see many teams getting over 30 points, um, those three down there. I think all three teams that will go down will get will get less than 30, personally. Some of them might, even, might not even get 25. Looking at the likes of Norwich and looking at the likes of um, Wolves, if they don't get their act together. Um, if we can get 45, if we can get at least 15 points clear of the bottom three, then that's a very, very healthy season as far as I'm concerned. And it doesn't matter whether that means we're finishing 14th or finishing 11th. It's not about league placings. It might be in terms of FFP because you get a couple of extra million, don't you? For every place on the table, you go up. That would be nice if we can finish as high as we can. But I think Frank Lampard and the rest of the management team, they'll just be looking at it and saying, right, we finished on 36 points last season. Let's finish on significantly more than that. Let's finish 10, 11, 12 points more than that. And if we can get to anywhere close to 50, then that's just a very, very, very healthy, solid year. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Foundations and building blocks. Um, in the game itself, we also saw um, Nathan Patterson come back. Um, at first, when he was first injured, there were rumours he might be out till... Uh, well, I think there was one rumour saying he might have been out till after the World Cup. Um, how good is it to see him back? He got a decent amount of minutes. Uh, I think it was about 34 minutes. Yeah, he got about half an hour, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm I'm really happy to see him back because everyone who's watched him, every Evertonian seems to be in love with him. But I think he makes a, a much more, our team is much more balanced with him in it because he can actually go down the line and look, and look to get crosses in. Uh, Coleman, as much as people like him, hasn't got that ability anymore. He just hasn't got the legs. And although he can do a job, defensively most of the time because he, he did very well against Lewis Taha the other week. I think there's a lot of wingers in this league who Coleman will go up against where he'll, he's going to come second against them and that seemed to be the case against Fulham. They were doubling up on him and he just wasn't, he was giving in his best as he always does but he just, he wasn't winning that battle he was having and the minute um, Patterson came on I felt a, a lot better and a lot more confident that we were going to see that game out without conceding. So I'm really happy for Nathan Patterson and hopefully that he's fully fit and he's ready to go and if Nathan Patterson doesn't have any more injuries between now and the end of the season, I wouldn't drop Nathan Patterson for any game unless, you know, something dramatic happens, unless he has an absolute nose dive in form, but I don't see that happening, really. No, yeah, and I, I completely agree. I, I'm, Antoine Robinson, everyone was raving about him and how much he was getting freedom down that left. And even William, who's the same age as Coleman, I thought he was sort of, like yeah, you said, well, he was doubling up. But well, William was... Left William left the Premier League like two years ago. He was chased out of Arsenal, wasn't he? He basically paid up his contract and held the door open for him. William was this finished footballer two years ago, and he was made to look like he was in his prime again. And I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, having a go at Coleman over it, but that just shows how limited Coleman is now. Um, certain teams he can do a job on, certain teams he won't. But Everton are undoubtedly a much better side when Nathan Patterson is in the team rather than Seamus Coleman. I just, I think that's. Just a, that's that's a fact, really. And as much as people like Seamus Coleman, if they try to deny that, then they're just not with us. Yeah, I, I completely agree. The other um, big talking point coming out of this was, despite um, no goals, uh, was people were sort of saying just how how much our defence has improved. Basically, all four defenders, I think, had well, all three of them uh, had all. Had, Good games. I think Pickford had a good game as well. Really good. Um, I think he was. I don't know if he was officially man of the match, but I, he's probably going to. He'd probably be my man of the match. Michael Enko had his best game in a while, hadn't he? I don't think Michael Michael Enko has been especially bad at any point this season, but it felt like his levels maybe dropped just a little bit. I know in the last couple of weeks, people have been a fair, a, a, a sizable um, section of the fan base have been saying, "Let's give that guy we've got on loan from Sporting Lisbon a chance." Is it Benagri? Uh, yeah. I think he's yeah. Yeah, I think he's only played for us once in the cup game where we went to, was it, was the game, we won one, I can't remember who it was against, we won 1-0. It was Damari Gray. Oh, was it Fleetwood? 
the Fleetwood, yeah. I think Van Aker, he's only yeah. played in that Fleetwood game. You know, we've not seen much of him since. Uh, he might have come off the bench, I think, once. And a lot of people were saying, right, Michael Enko's kind of levels have gone down. He's not he's not playing especially badly, but he's just not in very good form. He's getting beat um, by his market, by the player he's meant to be marking too often. Let's bring Van Aker in and let's see if he can make the place his own. But I think after that game against Fulham, Michael Enko's very much still the number one left back at Everton, uh, at least for now. Don't know whether he'll be that long term, as in season after season after season. But I think kind of the cut, the appetite to drop him and bring in that Fanagri has, you know, definitely gone down because that was a really good performance by Menkelenko. He, he played well against Palace as well, but I think just from a pure defensive point of view, that was one of Menkelenko's best performances in months, uh, as far as I can remember. He just down that left side, he did his job perfectly. Yeah, I, I think, um, like you said, he's been having a couple of solid games, but there's certain games isn't that he just shines a little bit brighter. Um, and and I, I fully get what you mean. I, I, the thing with that Vinagri is I, I don't think I've seen enough from him to sort of want to risk the chance. Um, because, because he's a you know an, an established international and he's played in the Champions League and he's quite seasoned, I think a lot of people forget how young Michael Enko is. He's only 22, 23. He's a, a young player who's going to go through, you know, periods of up and down form, isn't he? If he's 22, 23 now and he's, you know, more than holding his own in the Premier League, imagine how good he'll be when he's, you know, 26, 27, if he's still here. Now, I don't I don't believe he's going to become this sort of, you know, absolutely world-class uh, fullback who, in, um, you know, Barcelona or Real Madrid or Bayern Munich are going to be coming in for. I don't expect many people to be putting them in their fancy teams or for them to ever be getting in the Premier League team of the season, but He's a very young player who doesn't look like it's taken him long at all to adapt to the Premier League. Uh, he had a you know a rocky first couple of weeks, didn't he, when he first got here? But you have to consider all the other stuff that was going on in his life at the time. When you consider how young he is and the fact that his country's at war and the fact that his family are apparently not over here with him, Michael Enko's been pretty damn good as far as I'm concerned. And I felt that performance he put in against Fulham was just exactly what he needed it to remind it was it reminded everyone of just how well this lad has done since he come in and how sometimes people have been a bit unfair to criticize him when he's not at the best of games so really happy for michael Enko and i just don't see you know him getting dropped anytime soon like just like passing on the other side yeah no i i think um i can't remember who i said it to when um we were talking about him last time but he's he sort of has like solid maybe 6.8 at his low to sevens and that's like I he's think consistent, isn't he? he's, he's consistent. He, he doesn't. He's not a headline grabber for good or for bad. I, I don't think he's had any absolute bloomers since he arrived, has he? But and he's not going to get. I know he had that really great goal against Leicester, that crucial goal that in that win we had last season. But he's not a fullback who's going to be popping up with goals by the looks of it, like Luca Dean and Leighton Baines used to. They used to be getting four or five a season. Team like didn't he from free kicks or just, you know, long range belters. Maybe Michael Lenko's just that player who might pop up with the odd one or two here and there. But that's not what Michael Lenko's in the team for. He's not in the team to be a creator. I mean, he has got a little bit about him when he goes forward. He's not a Luca Dean or anything, but he can kind of get forward and um help out when we you know, when we're on the front foot and we've really got teams penned in. But People shouldn't be expecting too much of Michael Enko, really. And I'm really happy with what he's got to offer, which is just really solid defensive work. I, I completely agree, mate. Um, I'm going to ask you now to give me um, the player that you think could... Uh, give us uh, give us the player that you think could have improved didn't have that good of a game uh, for this game. A player who I thought was just... You know, it was not at it, really. Gordon. Gordon was anonymous, wasn't he? Really poor. Um, uh, would I drop Anthony Gordon considering his run of form? No, I'd give Anthony Gordon a little bit longer to get his form. But I mean, he did he did score against Palace. He played well in that game. He had a really couple of really good performances in the early weeks of the season. Um, I think Gordon and Gray didn't do enough either one of them. I think both of them are too hot and cold. And if I was going to drop one of them though, it would be Damari Gray. I, I Dwight McNeil as um, the same, he's had a couple of um, starts this season. He's looked good in some games, not so good in others. But the only player who I watched in that um, Fulham game and I thought, come on, mate, you're really not pulling your weight here. You deserve to go off, was Anthony Gordon. But 
again, he's young, isn't he? Um, I mean, you're going to get, every time he has a bad game, you're going to get people on social media uh, saying, oh, what were we thinking? We should have just sold him to Chelsea. He's not as good, blah, 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 blah. And they're entitled to those views, but they can't be going over the top with it. As I said, they can't be just, you know, getting on the lad's back and killing his confidence and making him, you know, turn him into the new Barkley where he's just terrified so he can do anything on the pitch. Um, he can't express himself because he's worried of the reaction he's going to get. Hopefully, Gordon's a bit mentally stronger than that, seems the type. But Anthony Gordon, I think Frank Lampard, if he's the manager I like to think he is, will have kind of had a quiet word with Anthony after that game and said, you you, you kind of let the side down a bit there. You needed to offer more. And if I play you in my next, if I start you next week, then I'm expecting a lot more of an effort from you. Well, no, that's the wrong way. Not more of an effort. I'm expecting a lot more output from you because Gordon does. Gordon is a trier. He's not a lazy player, Gordon. He does try. It's just there's some games where he's just too easily marked out of it and he's on the periphery. Yeah, I completely agree. Interestingly, you said Damari Gray. I think he's been struggling for a while. I don't think this is the first game I've watched him in and thought he struggled. Um, so Dwight McNeil a little bit in this. Um, I don't think I don't think enough to make it shine, but um, Damari Gray might be one that I think might end up being dropped for Dwight McNeil at some point uh, if his performances carry. If you could put Damari Gray and Dwight McNeil together in one player, you'd have one cracking wide forward. You would because they've got everything that the other hasn't got at all. McNeil is really is a dead ball specialist. You get the ball to him with a yard of space or so in the final third. He can really un, un, he can unlock a defence. He can finish. We've seen that. He can put in a really great through ball that that releases a striker. He can do damage if he can just get in the right areas and we can get the ball to him. Whereas Tamari Gray he can pick the ball up and get it forward 20, 30 yards. But his, his end product's just so often not there, isn't it? One thing that frustrates the life out of me with Tamari Gray is we'll be on a break, we'll be piling forward and he'll have his marker, the defender who he's running at, absolutely panicking, trying to keep up with him. And then he'll stop the play and put his foot over the ball and wait for two or three seconds before deciding what he's going to do. It, you'd think, he looks like he's trying to like do a trick or something like that, but I think he generally is trying, he just panics. I think he gets the ball and doesn't have any idea what he's going to do with it and then has to stop and take a moment. It used to be a problem that a Wolby used to have a lot when Awobi was getting stuck out wide. So I wouldn't um, totally write Damani Gray off. Hopefully we're just a bit better coaching. Uh, he can improve because Damani Gray, he's, he's been on the scene a while, but he's not really an old player either. There is still room, time for him to get better. But Gray just frustrates the life out of me when he just kills all those momentum and attacks. He takes too long to make up his mind. And if Damani Gray gets dropped, then I wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't have any sympathy for him. I think he's going to have to do something in the next couple of months to remind Evertonians of why he should be here or to convince Evertonians that he should be here for the long term. Because I think a lot of fans, if we parted ways with him in the next 12 months or so, wouldn't be that sad, really. We got him for hardly anything. I think 1.5 million. We're bound to move him on for a profit if we do move him on. Whether that's a big profit or a little profit, we're we're going to get something more than 1.5. But if he wants to basically be part of this project long term and um, being here in three or four years when we hopefully are a team that challenges for Europe again, I think he has to do a lot more than what he's been doing over the last 18 months. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, so give me the player that you think's done, uh, that played well. Give us the player you think, Sean. There's a few, but they're all defensive players. Michael Enko, um, Pickford, obviously, saves our bacon. Loads of really good saves. I don't get at all why anyone thinks that he shouldn't be England's number one. He absolutely should be. He's by far and away the best English goalkeeper. He's not perfect, but He's a lot closer to perfect than the likes of Ramsdale or Nick Pope or anyone like that. So him, um, I thought Tarkowski and Cody were handled Mitrovic really well. Mitrovic is, you know, an old fashioned batter and ram of a striker. Um, a lot of he, he has a one to one battle with centre halves. There's not many centre halves in this league who I think would get the better of Mitrovic, and I think Tarkowski handled them very well, and Cody read the play very well as well. A pair of them. Um, did everything and more that we needed of them and one other player I'll give a mention to who I thought played well was um, Onana I'm, I'm really impressed with that fella Onana I think he's got a lot of growing to do he's raw he makes mistakes he can be a bit lackadaisical on the ball and a bit um, dopey at times but I think the fundamentals that, that he looks to have are just really really good and he develops the way I think a lot of fans are hoping he's going to develop then 
in three or four years, I wouldn't be surprised if he goes abroad and he's playing in a league winning team, whether it's whether it's Man City, whether it's it won't be Liverpool, but whether it's Man City, whether it's um, Chelsea, whether it's over to Italy, whether it's over to Germany. I just think that fella's ceiling is so, so high. And I think he's going to have a very, very, very good football career. And hopefully he spends a good deal of it, if not all of it, with Everton. Fingers crossed. Hopefully, hopefully. But I can see what you mean. The potential is there. Um, that is everything we've got time for today, though, on the Extra Time segment. Paul, thanks for joining me, mate. It's been a pleasure. No worries, mate. It's, as I said, wasn't the best result in the world, but it absolutely wasn't a, wasn't a terrible result. It's a good point. Another one on the board. We're pretty. We're looking pretty uh, sweet and happy where we are right now. We're nowhere near as bad as the teams that are look like they're going to be in a relegation dogfight. You know, we look miles better than the likes of Forest or the likes of um, Wolves or the likes of um, Leeds. I know Leeds got a good result the other night against Liverpool, but I look at those teams and think they're definitely, definitely not finishing above Everton unless something absolutely crazy happens. So we just got to, um, you know, take the rough with the smooth, haven't we? And it's a season of stability. We're going to have wax on the nose. We're going to have games that we lose and we lose badly and it's going to upset everyone. And we're probably going to have games that we win and we win really well and we put everyone on a high, but we've just got to make sure we temper our reactions no matter what happens. Completely agree. Don't forget, guys, to like the video as well. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. Uh, comment down below your thoughts. And uh, if you follow the link in the description, there's a link to uh, Toffee Blue's Christmas Jumper in the shop. So go check that out. And if you like it, buy it for any of your relatives. It could be a Christmas present, whatever. Uh, see you guys very, very soon. <laughs>